Okay, yes, so thanks for everyone for coming today. Today we're going to have our little seminar series for the Anomalology Discord server kicked off by Andrea Antonucci, who is actually presently visiting SCGP. Um, and yeah, he's talking about a very exciting subject. We thought it might be a good way to kick off the seminar series, especially since, I mean, I can't speak for him, but I usually think of him as a guy who works on high energy physics topics, but the title seemed like very condensed mattery, and I thought hopefully that appeals to a, a lot of people and uh, it's really in the spirit of the, the server. So anyway, Andrea, you can take it away when you're ready. Okay, thank you. And hi everybody for, for coming and thank you for inviting me to give this talk. And I have been told that this is supposed to be a quite mixed audience, including people from various from various fields. And hopefully this will be actually a, a, a mixed talk. I will talk about stuff from uh, statistical mechanics, from high energy physics, from holography, from condensed matter, from generalized global symmetries. This is based on a paper I wrote together with Giovanni Galati, Giovanni Rizzi and, and Marco Serone. And so all these, to all these topics uh, have this common thread of, of random couplings. And I will, okay, since this will be quite mixed, I will try to give a uh, elementary introduction to let's say the, the topics that we'll talk about, and they will start by actually introducing uh, what are these uh, systems with random couplings and for which kind of, uh, of physical systems they are relevant. And so you start from your favorite local quantum field theory. For me, a local quantum field theory will be simply something which comp computes correlation function by a, by a path integral, a path integral over fields uh, and weighted by an action, which is a, a local function all over of the fields, this is not maybe the most modern, cool definition of what is a local quantum field theory, but this is the one they will take. And this is very hard, as you know very well, but we can make it even harder. We can make it harder by deforming our, our local quantum field theory, that we call the pure theory, by random couplings. And by this, I mean that I add a certain local operator to the, to the action, and I will be interested in average correlation function. So the first thing that you do is to, for fixed value of the coupling, you compute the correlation function, and then you take the average with a suitable uh, probability distribution. So here, it's important that I want to emphasize that this average is, uh, is really taken after you compute the ratio between the, the path integral with insertion of operator and the path integral without insertion. So you first compute the correlation function, and then you take the average. And this way of taking the average uh, goes under the name of quenched average, which is opposed to the annealed, annealed average, where you perform the average together with the, with the path integral over fields. And this is relevant for, for several physical systems. And there are two different situations that we will talk about in this, uh, in this talk with, with applications in, uh, in, different, uh, in different physical scenarios. The first one, which I will refer to as disorder, is when the random coupling is space-time dependent. You might not you, you might be in the Euclidean, so uh, there could be no time, but the important thing is that it depends on all the coordinates that you have. And this is relevant for, for classical statistical mechanical system with impurities. The typical example is the random bond ising model. You, you, you take your ising model, think about you have a magnet, but in this magnet, you, you, this could be impure, meaning that the interaction um, among nearby spin could depend from side to side. So this is a, a, a huge complication of the standard Ising model. And uh, analyzing it precisely, it is very hard. But you, what you can do is to, um, is to ask only for average property. You extract your, your impure magnet from a sample of, um, of very simple impure magnets. And, and so you compute correlation function Obtain it by averaging over all the possibilities for these uh, for these uh, non-uniform couplings, and to connect with the terminology that they had before. Here I'm presenting as a certain lattice system, but uh, we will work in continuum quantum field theory, so we will take the the continuum approximation, the continuum formalism, and uh, so this is a classical statistical mechanical system. So the the action is really what is the Hamiltonian here, and the pure theory is described by the standardizing model with the uh, interaction which is given by the average and then the shift from the average is the is the random coupling which is fluctuating and they will average over it right so 
Th this kind of systems can have a, a long distance and infrared behavior, which is very different from the one of the pure system. You, you can be really in different phases with respect to the, the pure system. So all, often this is a very, it's a very huge modification of your system. And to understand uh, what are the possible infrared behavior, it's useful to know about this, this criterion, this criterion, which is kind of an RG criterion, classifying what are the possible behavior of the system after I add this, uh, this disorder, this, um, this random deformation. If the dimension of the, uh, the operator that had is, is greater than the half, the deformation is irrelevant. If it's equal to the half is marginal, is, and if it's less than the half, it's, it's relevant. And by this, I mean really in the RG sense. So when, when the deformation is relevant, the, um, the infrared behavior of the system can be very different from the one of the, of the pure one, and it could be gapped, or you could reach new fixed points called disorder, conformal field theories, and so you can have this new, new critical, new um, critical fixed points where you have different critical exponents from the one of the pure theory. And sometimes, since you are doing this process of averaging over couplings, you can lose unitarity. And this CFT sometimes can be a logarithmic CFT. You can have two-point function of, uh, of primary operators, which on top of power law, of the usual power law behavior, also ex exhibit logarithm. It, just a quick question. These, yeah. But they're still local CFTs. They're still like a stress yeah. tensor. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, yes, yes. Okay. It's local. Everything is local here. And as it will be important at the end of the, the talk, uh, this locality is really encoded in the fact that you are averaging over coupling, which are space-time dependent. So you are keeping unitarity. But uh, thank you for the question, because the other case that I will consider in the talk is kind of the opposite orthogonal case in which the random couplings are constant. And you could have uh, like mixed situation in which the coupling depend only on certain coordinates and not another, but I will only consider these two, these two possibility in this talk. Maybe at the end I will comment on kind of mixed situations, but in this other case, which I will call ensemble average case, I'm not sure about whether this is the like commonly accepted terminology disorder versus ensemble average, but this is the terminology that we we'll use. And uh, already from the example that I gave you from the, of the uh, random boundaries in model, you can understand that taking the coupling to be constant, this is, this is not relevant for statistical mechanical system. But remarkably, it turns out to be relevant for quantum gravity. And to explain why this is the case, since maybe not everybody is familiar with this, uh, the usual uh, statement of the holographic correspondence is that you want to consider quantum gravity in a, in a, in a d plus one dimensional bulk space time with fixed boundary conditions. So you're fixing the boundary manifold, you fix the boundary value of the bulk gate fields. Uh, and so your quantum gravity partition function is supposed to, uh, to sum over all the bulk possibility. And this is supposed to be equal to the partition function of an ordinary quantum field theory living on the boundary with background fields for this quantum field theory equal to the boundary values of the bulk gauge fields. Right, so this is the very standard statement of holography, but this is puzzling when you start considering boundary manifolds which are disconnected. And the reason is very simple. The quantum field theory partition function on this connected manifold factorizes. It's just a product of the partition function. But this is not quite so for the partition function of quantum gravity. Indeed, if you take the, the boundary, which is disconnected, since quantum gravity is supposed to sum over all, all bulk geometry, including sum over bulk topologies, so you will have several topologies which are disconnected. But you can have topologies which are connected. Those are commonly known as Euclidean wormholes, let's say. And so you can have disconnected boundaries with a connected bulk. And this is telling you that if this contribution are non-vanishing, your quantum gravity partition function will not factorize. So you cannot really equate to partition function with so different behavior under this if you put disconnected, if you put disconnected boundaries. And the solution which have been proposed along the years is to replace a standard quantum field theory in the boundary with an ensemble average of various quantum field theory. So you take an ensemble of quantum field theory with different couplings and you perform an average of, of all these couplings. This can solve this, this factorization puzzle because for fixed coupling, the, quant the uh, partition function of quantum field theory factorized, but then you take the average and of course the average of the product is not equal to the product of the average. So you might hope to solve this factorization puzzle with this different proposal. 
And here, let me emphasize that it is very important here that to solve the factorization puzzle, the random coupling constant must be constant. Uh, because if, if you take it to be space-time dependent, you will recover locality and, uh, and the partition function will still factorize. So you have to take it constant and you can hope to solve this factorization problem. Maybe I can just make a, a comment here. Yeah. Um, this is this factorization issue is an issue of semi-classical of the semi-classical gravitational path integral. Yes. We don't believe it's true in UV complete quantum. It's an issue in UV complete quantum gravity. I completely agree. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Indeed, it is it often arise in, in like uh, let's say effective theory of gravity. You yeah. will not believe that it's true in string theory. But if you want to extend holography even for effective theory of gravity, you have to take into account this issue. And in in both cases, in but in the case of, of um, constant random coupling and the one of space time dependent coupling, uh, analyzing the system is very hard. There are very few analytic techniques that one can use. Uh, it's much more harder than studying usual quantum field theory, which is already hard, but this is much harder. And when there are such few analytic techniques, you often want to rely on symmetry. You want to understand what are the symmetries of the problem and understand if the symmetry can constrain what are the possible output of the, of the physics that you want to discuss. But actually, before really asking what are the symmetries, we should ask what is the definition of symmetry in this kind of different physical situation? This might seem a stupid question, but actually it is not. And depending on what kind of physical problem you want to analyze, uh, there can be different notion or what different relevant notion of what we, do we mean by symmetry. You know, in quantum mechanics, uh, you, you say that symmetries are just operator commuting with the Hamiltonian. But then already when you look in, in local quantum field theory, there can be various definitions. The, the old one, which is uh, taken from, let's say, classical field theory, is that you want to Define symmetry search transformation of the fields which preserve the path integral, but acts on, on, on some local operator. But this is not a very intrinsic definition. This really relies on what is our presentation of, of, our, of our theory in terms of, of specific fields and so on. We would like to give a, an intrinsic definition that if you give me a quantum system, which is a local quantum field theory, I'm able to tell you whether there are symmetries or not and which are the symmetries. And a very intrinsic definition that you can give is to identify symmetries with selection rules. With the fact that certain correlators, if the operator in certain correlator do not satisfy certain condition, must automatically vanish. This is very intrinsic, but unfortunately this is not enough because symmetries are, are not just a bunch of selection rules. There are many things that we, we would like to do with symmetries. We want to discuss spontaneous symmetry breaking. We want to ex discuss the Landau paradigm, classifying the phases of, of quantum field theory in terms of how symmetry are realized on the vacuum. We want to couple our symmetry to background, discussing anomaly engaged. So there are many, many things that we want to do with symmetries, which we cannot do by just knowing that there are a bunch of selection rules. So that the modern definition of what are symmetries in quantum field theory is to identify symmetries with topological operators. This is, if you, if you think about it, it's really the most straightforward generalization of the definition we gave in quantum mechanics as operator commuting with the Hamiltonian. In that case, it is telling you that you can slide your operator a long time. Here we have a local quantum field theory, so, so we can um, deform the operator in, in every direction and we get a topological operator. The correlation function will not depend on the detail of the support, but only on its topological class. And this definition has several advantages. Uh, first, as many of you know very well, you, you can cook up various generalization, higher from symmetries, higher groups, uh, non-invertible symmetries, so on and so forth. You can give a unified description of discrete and continuous symmetries. Uh, and putting a topological operator is equivalent to uh, turning on a background gauge field so you can discuss anomaly. So you can, all the things that you like about symmetry are encoded in the knowledge of, of the fact that there is a certain topological operator you can play with it. So we would like to extend this notion even to these systems in which we are averaging over, over certain couplings. And I will start to do it in the, in the case of, of disordered systems, namely the coupling are now space-time dependent. And a typical situation is that you start from your pure theory, it, it, it has a certain global symmetry, G, 
But when you up this uh, this coupling, this coupling can break the global symmetry. This will happen any times that the, the operator that you are adding is charged under the symmetry. However, this kind of system are, are quite common even, I mean, really in reality, they are, I mean, every, every system is actually not pure. So in, in real labs, you have to deal with impure systems. So there are really experimental observations you can make, uh, but as I told you, the systems are very complicated to study theoretically, so people employ uh, numerical analysis. And it, it is often observed that um, the if you just ask for the average property of the system, the symmetry will re-emerge on average. Meaning that if you only look for this average property, the disorder system behave as if the symmetry is there. And from our perspective, indeed, that we are looking really at average correlation function, it, it turns out to be quite easy to prove that the average correlation function, even if you're breaking the symmetry with the local operator, uh, still displays several selection rules, namely that several average correlation function identically vanish if the sum of the charge of the operator is non-zero. And it is, it is easy to, um, to prove this by a simple periodic trick in the patina integral, namely assign formal transformation property to the, to the, to the random coupling. And let me emphasize that this, this, um, the validity of this selection rule does not even require that the random coupling are space-time dependent. This derivation is easy to apply also to the case of ensemble average. But as I told you, symmetries are much more than just selection rules. So we would like to give an intrinsic definition of symmetries in this kind of system, which goes beyond selection rules. Uh, namely, we would like to construct the, the analog of a, of a topological operator, namely an operator which is topological, but only on average. And I will actually give you the, the um, affirmative answer to this question in this disorder case. I will actually give you the derivation of it and this, in the simplest case of uh, a U1 symmetry. And the reason why I want to explain the derivation, actually there are two reasons. One is that it is relatively simple. So I think it's, uh, it's doable to follow the derivation here during the talk. But most importantly, I think that the derivation is quite illuminating. There will be a certain crucial step that it will do at a certain point, which, which really uses the fact that we are dealing with coupling, which are space-time dependent. And this will be not possible in the case that we'll discuss later on of the ensemble average. And the, the failure of this, uh, of this step will teach us uh, several important things for this other cl class of system, the one ensemble average, which are relevant for holography. Right. So. Let, let me consider this uh, simplest case of a U1 symmetry. So in the pure system, you have a conserved current. And this is defined the usual way by uh, performing a, a transformation of the field, which is space-time dependent. The action is not invariant, usual thing. Yeah, this is not invariant. You get this, this current. Uh, and if, if you perform this change of variable inside the part integral with uh, external surfaces turn on, turned on, you arrive at the, at the word identity that you learn in textbooks. Right. But now, when you are the random coupling, of course, uh, this, uh, this current JMU does not satisfy the word identity. But interestingly, okay, you, you might have been thought that, okay, this not, does not satisfy the word identity, but the word identity on average should be satisfied. But this turns out to be not true. This current uh, is, not, is not really a conserved current, even, in the, even after average. So what's going on? Because I told you that we, I will tell you that we will succeed in finding the analog of the topological operator. And the point is that we should do some more smart thing in the, in this derivation. And if, if you think about it, as, as I emphasized at the beginning, it's very important in this class of systems that you perform the sequential average. You have to take the average over the coupling after you compute the ratio between the particular with insertion and the partition function. And so the more, more smart thing to do is to perform this change of variable both in the denominator and in, in the denominator. And if you do this, you, you get two contributions in the ordinary case, this should be separately zero, but in this case, it is really the sum which is zero. So these are like ordinary word identities, but you have to combine in these ways. Uh, of course, if you take functional derivative with respect to the external sources, you will get a certain identity, which is this one. Can I write it? Yes, this is word identity here. Uh, 
which looks like a worded entity, but it's not, because we have this second ugly term. And pay attention that this is a worded entity written in terms of, of different operators. It is not the original current, which is conserved, but this shifted current, which I obtained by taking my original current and subtracting its value. And let me emphasize here that at first sight, you might think that this is a mild violation. I'm actually just subtracting a constant, but it is not simply a constant because it's a complicated non-local functional of the, of the coupling H. This is the verb computed in a theory with fixed values of H. So this is a, a complicated modification because at the end, I, we want to take the average over, over H and this, will be, and, and this will be a drastic modification. And I also introduced this shifted operator O tilde. All the dildos operator will be, will be the shifted one. But okay, importantly, yeah. I was going to say, maybe I could just ask. So I, I guess I could probably just do it myself, but maybe you've already done it. So this is for the quenched disorder. Yes. Uh, where you sum over the the H after taking the correlation function. Yes. If you do the annealed, where you do them both at the same time, is there something analogous that happens or something interesting or? Yeah, in that case, I haven't we haven't analyzed it, but I would say it's even simpler. Yeah, because uh, you wouldn't you, have to do you, this you trick. Don't get, yeah, you don't get the denominator. You just you just have the unshifted operator. Sorry. Right, makes sense. Yeah, okay, yeah. cool. Um, good. May so, I ask but, another question? Yeah. So the fact that the current has a non-trivial web means that uh, Lorentz is spontaneously broken or something like that. Does the yes, yes, disorder but, break it? Yeah, 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 precisely. Because I'm uh, H is dependent on, on X, so you are breaking explicitly the translation in each sample. So even even vectors, uh, I mean, L uh, Lorentz is not spontaneously broken, but it's less, it's, it's really Poincaré, which is spontaneously broken. So it's you explicitly may... broken, right? Sorry, sorry, explicitly broken, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. It's, and if you uh, take the yeah. coupling to be constant, then yeah. the web would go away. Yes, indeed. At the end, uh, I will consider that case, and we will get rid of these webs. Okay. Thank you. So, but okay. it's also an average symmetry, right? What do you mean? Uh, you consider average Poincaré symmetry in systems? Yeah, yeah, of course. O on average, on average, uh, also Poincaré reemerges as symmetry. Right. Indeed, I am giving this derivation for a U1 symmetry, but you can do it even for the stress energy tensor. You will prove that even if the the disorder perturbation explicitly breaks the symmetry. On average, you, you recover you recover the the full the full Poincaré invariance, right? But so let, let, let me let me emphasize that until this point, I haven't used the the locality of this random coupling H. So this could hold even in the ensemble average case. But the point is really about this, this second term here, which is the departure from a standard word entity. And what I'm going to do now is to use the locality of, of H to show that this second term here, in this case, is, is zero, is identically vanished. And the, the crucial point is that even in the H path integral, you can perform, since H is X dependent, you can perform this change of variable, which is X dependent. And by doing it, you can prove this other identity, which by taking functional derivative with respect to external sources, you can really prove that it is equivalent to say that the second term here is vanishing. So in this case, in this uh, in this disorder case, you can really get this this worded entity for this shifted current. And let me emphasize again that this looks like a, a very standard worded entity, but it is not for the original current J. It is for this shifted current, which has a, a term which depends on age and enters strongly in the average in the average of uh, over age. Right. So this is not a mild, a mild uh, modification at all. Now, okay, this we, we construct the current. The second step is to construct the charge operator. And this is very easy. You just integrate the current over your, your favorite co-dimensional one manifold, uh, sub-manifold in your space time. And this is just the original charge operator uh, minus its web. And again, it's a complicated non-local functional of H. But then you want to do the third step, just construct the finite symmetry operator. And you may say, ha ha, okay, this is very trivial. I just take the exponential, but this is, this is wrong. This is wrong, the exponential is not gonna work. And you, you can, you, you can uh, convince yourself that uh, this is not going to work even by expanding that at the second order, you will see that the, the operator obtained by the square of the of this Q tilde charge is not what measures the, the square of the total charge. But I'm not going to give you the details, but the actual symmetry operator, which is going to work is actually the ratio of the original uh, topological operator of the pure theory divided by its back, right? 
So, okay, you, you, you have this operator, which again is age dependent, uh, and this turns out to be the analog of the topological operator in this disordered system. It's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a symmetry operator, which is topological on all on average. If you take it in, a, if you put it in, in a normal correlation function, it will not be topological, but it turns out to be topological when you, when you look only for average correlation function. And from this, you can you can do many things because now we have the topological operator, so we have the intrinsic general definition of what are symmetries in this kind of problem. Notice that this this formula above makes sense even even for discrete symmetry. So you can generalize to, to discrete symmetry. You can do whatever you want. You, and assuming that there is no spontaneous symmetry breaking, of course you can prove selection rule. You already knew about selection rule, but you can also prove it starting from the topological operator. Then. Putting a topological operator is equivalent to turning on a background gauge field. So you can couple the symmetry to background fields and lack of gauge invariance under a background gauge transformation allows you to define anomalies. So you can put constraints on the long distance uh, uh, behavior of your, of your systems. So, so you have many, many more uh, analytic techniques to give proposal of, of, on, on the behavior of your system. Uh, moreover, uh, something that you can prove is that your if your original pure system has a, has a symmetry G with a certain anomaly, let's say a bosonic anomaly, omega, and if the symmetry reemerges after average, it reemerges with the same anomaly. So it, it's even easy to, to compute the anomalies in this case. And you can do many other things. For instance, even if the symmetry is trivially gapped, you can have a trivial SPT phases for, for this symmetry. So you can start discussing phases of mother, which are protected by this disordered symmetry. I will call them disordered symmetry, and you can do many other things. You can gauge it and so on and so forth. So you really have a, a, a topological operator. You have an intrinsic definition of what is a symmetry in this uh, in this problem, and you can analyze it as you do in in standard local quantum field theory. So, uh, other question, or I can proceed to the next case. Yeah, maybe I can just ask. So, yeah, do you? You showed a sort of general theorem there, but is there any other sort of general theorem? But like, if your original th theory had G symmetry, under what conditions does the ensemble theory have an emergent averaged G symmetry, et cetera? Like, are there theorems of that for form or? Yeah, so, sorry, I, I haven't mentioned this, but you, you have to take a specific uh, probability distribution. I mean, not, not specific yeah. probability distribution, but there are conditions on the probability distribution. Sure, sure. So like when you're averaging over H, like you, if you put some Gaussian distribution, do you generically recover? Yeah, like with, you, you, with, yeah. With, with Gaussian distribution, yes, basically uh -huh. always. Okay. For, yeah. uh, uh, for instance, just to, to give you the example, if you if you have a U1 symmetry, any, any probability distribution, which depend on only on the combination H, H bar, will will uh, tell you that you will recover the symmetry. Mm. If you have something like H plus H bar, you will not. Right, yeah. I see. I see. You essentially just want the distribution to be symmetric, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. But you, you, you have to specify what does it mean symmetric. Yeah. But basically you assign opposite uh, symmetry property to H, the one that, that you have on or not. Yeah, you, you, you give a formal, a formal representation to H and uh, under the formal representation of H, the probability distribution must be symmetric. And the, for any, any symmetric probability distribution, we, we recover the symmetry. Right. So now I want to slowly move to the case of ensemble average, but to, to develop some intuition, I think it's, it's worth mentioning another, another approach that you can take in this kind of systems, um, which kind of, of relates this, this uh, random coupling system to ordinary systems. So you can develop some intuition and understand why this ensemble average case behaves so differently with respect to, to the disorder case, as I will explain. And this, this is a standard technique, as a, the, the replica trick, which is, can be used many times to analyze the system with random couplings. Uh, the version that I will use, the version that I will use is simply uh, start from the observation that the, the um, generating function of four connected correlators can be obtained in this way by, by uh, taking the n power of, of the partition function, assuming that you can analytically continue n, and then you take the derivative and, and you take this, this limit n going to zero. So there are several very delicate operations that you are doing here, but it is, it is known that uh, in large class of system, this is going to work. And the advantage of, the advantage of doing this in this, in this quenched disorder case is that 
the connected the, the way of getting connected correlation function out of the generating functional do not involve taking the, um, the ratio. You, 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 you just take functional derivative. So everything is linear and you can get the average connected correlation function uh, by taking the average over the um, over the generating function. So everything is linear. It enters inside this, uh, this, uh, this processes. And if you assume that you have a Gaussian probability, then you, you can perform the integral over h exactly because h appears quadratically. And if you do this, you can obtain that the average of the of the w is given by the limit for n going to zero of a part integral, which you replicate your 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 part integral n times. And the action is a, is a kind of standard action. Is uh, I mean here you, you you got rid of the of the random coupling, but this replicated action is the sum of n time your original action coupled among them some with this term involving the operator that you added. And so the kind of the slogan is that you can relate the average co connected correlation function with suitable limit of suitable non-analytic continuation in M of, of a standard quantum field theory, which I will call the, the replica theory. Okay, the, this has some drawbacks. First of all, uh, I I had to assume a Gaussian probability, but if you're fine with this, it's okay. But then there are several uh, assumptions that you have to make. First, you have to assume that there is this analytic continuation in N, and you can take this N going to zero limit and everything is regular in this limit. This is not obvious at all. But if, if you neglect this problem for a moment, you, you can see a very simple fact that any, any symmetry G of the pure system in the replica theory gets replicated in time, but this interaction term breaks this uh, G3 and symmetry to the, to, to the diagonal. So you have one conserved current, which is the diagonal current, and it turns out that working a bit combinatorially, you, you can actually recover all the results that I told you before, even in this uh, in this other in this other framework. And the advantage of doing this is that disorder symmetry becomes manifest ordinary symmetry in this replica theory. So you, you, I, I will not go into this uh, this derivation because it's just repeating the same results in another in another way. But the reason why I'm mentioning this is that it allows us to slowly move. Uh, to the case of, of ensemble average, because the, the replica theory, the, um, sorry, the replica trick still work in ensemble average case, taking H to be constant, and formally looks like the same, right? You still have a, a, a Gaussian integral, you perform the integral over H, but the crucial fact is that the, the replica theory is now a non-local theory. Because since H is, a, is constant, when you do this integral, you get a double integral over or not, uh, or not of x and or not of y. So uh, non-local theories are very nasty. Uh, I'm not very happy to work with, with, with non-local theory. It's very complicated. There are very there are a lot of unintuitive facts that can happen in non-local theory. And here you see that from the action, the, the symmetry gain is manifest. If you have a U1, a U1 symmetry, this additional term preserves the U1 symmetry. So again, I have a, a manifest symmetry. But the point is that if you compute the, 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 the network current for this symmetry, it turns out to be a non-local current. So th this is a, a, a very scary object. And for instance, I don't really know how much it makes sense to construct a topological operator out, on, on, out of a non-local current. I'm going to integrate it over, over a, a co-dimension one submanifold, but then still it has a dependence on an integral over the world space-time manifold. So I'm not sure whether this will make sense or not. And of course, selection rules are there, but I'm not really comfortable in, in saying that we really have a symmetry. So it's 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 really a, a strange situation. And indeed, I'm going to I, I'm just presenting this to uh, allow you to develop some intuition uh, about why this uh, this ensemble average case can behave so differently from from the deserted case. And I'm now going to abandon this uh, approach of, um, of, of the replica trick. I will come back to the original approach. Uh, I will come back to the original approach and I will actually see that the manifestation of these of this strange facts that I'm mentioning here uh, in the original approach, but hopefully in a more like clear way. But it's important to keep in mind that when you are dealing with this ensemble average case, in some way, your theory is secretly non local. So very good. Uh, so as 
as uh, I was already mentioning before, uh, now for simplicity, I will assume that my deformation is a, is a scalar. And, and so uh, I'm no longer breaking uh, the translation invariance and I can get rid of the maths. So everything, now that the shifted operators turns out to be equal to the unshifted ones. And as I, as I told you during the, um, the derivation before, uh, at some point, we, we arrive at this, uh, at this identity, which as I told you, uh, it's valid even in this ensemble average case. I didn't have to assume locality of edge. So we can restart from here. And the point is that I have this, this ugly second term, which is the departure from an ordinary word identity. And in the resorted case, I was able to prove that this, uh, this second term was vanishing because I, I could do this trick of, of performing this uh, H dependent, this, uh, sorry, this X dependent change of variable inside the H pack integral. And the crucial fact is, is now uh, I, I can no longer do this. I can no longer do this because H is a, is a constant, so it makes no sense to perform this change of variable. But okay, uh, just for rotation, I will call this uh, this uh, this term H or not uh, with this curly D, depending on a, X and H. And but okay, so the best thing that I can do is to perform a constant change of variable in, in H. And if you think about it for a while, this will not prove that the second term is uh, is zero, but it will it will prove that the integral of this term over the full space time is is is, uh, is zero. Let me emphasize that this is the full space time, right? So on average, every correlation function with the insertion of this operator will not be zero, but its integral over the the variable on which this this d depends is zero. So this is a weaker condition, right? But of course it is enough to prove selection rules because if you take this, this identity and you integrate, if you assume that there is no voltaire symmetry breaking so that the current vanishes at infinity, you can prove you can prove selection rules. But I, I wanted to construct a topological operator. I wanted to do many other things with symmetry. And here it seems we're in trouble. But what we can try to do, and indeed the, there will be important differences, but there is something a little bit better than just saying that we have selection rules. And what, uh, what we can try to do is to construct this operator, which depends on a, on a co-dimension one manifold, sigma d minus one, but it also depends on, on a filling region, on a region whose boundary is your co-dimension one manifold. And from the um, uh, obvious charge operator, you are subtracting this term, which is integrated over a region, which is a term depending on this d, this h or not. Right, so you can say, but what are you doing? This is not a co-dimension one operator. This seems to make no sense. It seems that you, you could even do this for any explicitly broken symmetry. So why am I doing this? And if you trust me for a moment, I will explain that constructing this operator is not that crazy is not a useless thing to do. It's not just formal, but it implies consequences. First, okay, notice that since I need a filling region, uh, it turns out that I can support this operator only on homologically trivial manifolds, right? But now let me consider the first case in which I'm taking my, my space time to be a connected, a connected space time. So every every homologically trivial co-dimension one manifold will divide my connected space time into connected region. This is kind of a generalization of the Jordan Cartier that you learn in the textbook. And okay, this is kind of obvious. So you have, but the important thing is that you have only two possible regions. So you don't have so many possibility for what is this filling region, because as I told you, the main drawback that you can think about from this operator, it's not really a co-dimension one operator, it depends on the choice of a spilling of, of a filling region. But in this case, there are only two filling regions that I can choose. And if you compute the, the difference between these two, these two Q hat operator, you, you get that the difference is just the integral over the, of, over the full space time of D, of this, uh, of this curly D operator. And because of the condition, of the weak, weaker condition that I gave you before, this operator is not zero, but it turns out to be zero on average, right? So on average, these two possible QF operators with different filling regions are, 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 are equal on average. So in, in, in connected space times, there is really no dependence on the filling region. And 
So we can really say that this QAT operator is a genuine co-dimension one operator, which is, top, which is topological on average. So this is a, a bit better than just saying that we have, that we have selection rules, but still there are important differences. Uh, I mean, as I told you, it, it is required that this co-dimension one surface is homologically trivial. So G, the symmetry G, even if it reemerges on average, if you want to call it symmetry, it cannot be coupled to background gauge field. There is, there is no concept of background gauge field. So there cannot be any concept of anomaly. There cannot be any concept of, of gauging the symmetry because it's, it's, I mean, it's an operator, but it cannot put on homologically non-trivial manifold. So there are restrictions on where you can put the operator. And, and so, homologically, so, yes. So, um, is this operator invertible? Yes. Then I'm I'm a little bit confused because it seems like it'll always be the trivial operator, um, because if it's if it's topological and invertible, then it's invariant under homology deformation. So if you insert it on a trivial homology class, you should be able to deform it to deform it to nothing, and so it looks like it would always act as the identity operator. Am I making a mistake there? No, but if you have insertion of charged operator when you, when you pass it, you will get phases. It's like the usual thing. But then it won't be inserted on, homo on a homolog homologically trivial cycle. No, so, so, sorry, sorry. I, 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 it wasn't that precise. It must be homologically trivial in, um, in, the, in the space time, no, not in the space time with, with, with operator removes. So maybe just to, to understand that. So if you insert another operator, in the volume of support of this this curly D, yeah. Does it still is it still does yes, it still it vanish on average even with any other operator even with a yeah. charged operator insertion? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, this, this is just the content of this identity. You see, this identity of... for any other operator insertion. Yeah, yes. It is really that it's only the, the topology of space time which can change its output. And indeed, I mean, does this mean that you can that, that that sort of suggests to me that you could then define this operator on top homologically non-trivial cycles as well? Uh, no, I mean, it depends on homologically non-trivial in which manifold. I'm saying it it it, it can be homologically non-trivial in the manifold that you obtain from your spacetime by removing certain operators, right? But I, with the, the it, it it cannot be homolog it cannot be homologically non-trivial uh, just in the space-time manifold. It That's requires... a little bit confusing to me though, because if you have a if you wanted to insert it, suppose you want to insert it on a on a cycle which is homologically non-trivial, you could imagine states take a neighborhood of that cycle, imagine states running in that, and then apply some, you know hand-waving and state operator correspondence, and then you've told me how to define its action on operators and states. And so I, it, it seems like you might be able to define it on a general cycle, but it might be more complicated. I don't know. I don't know. Um, the point here is really that you start from, from, from this identity, which tells you which kind of operator you can insert. Maybe, maybe, maybe it could be that not all operators can, can be inserted. I don't know. Here, it is just that certain operators are allowed to be inserted on the on the let's say word volume of these of these operators but sure. you cannot put it you, you cannot put it like on, on a homological non trivial cycle of a torus are you sure you can't put it or you just don't know how to put it i don't know how to define it let's okay say. okay okay i don't know how to define well can't it. you just say you go to the replica picture you can What's the problem with defining it there? We just want to define boundary conditions, right? Oh, Twisted yeah, boundary in, conditions for all of the fields. In the in the, in the replica and, picture. And okay, it looks weird because it's a non-local theory, but the action will still be invariant. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. In the in the replica theory, this operator has its appearance. It looks a, a bit um, different. I think we actually wrote it in the paper. What is the form of the operator in this um, in the replica theory? But still, you you get the same problems. But it's a bit more complicated how to define it because in the, the point is that in the replica theory, you get this no local current. So uh, it, it involves- Well, another thing you could do, sorry, maybe another yeah. thing you could do is you could define it in each 
you know, with each disorder potential, you can define this operator. It won't be topological, but on average, it will satisfy the word identity. So inserted in a disorder averaged correlation function, it will be topological. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. Okay, good. Yeah. All right, yeah, it, 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 it is not topological before the average, never. It will be only topological after the average. This is what I mean by, by topo topological operator on average. Yeah, in the in, in correlation function, before you take the integral over h, it is not topological. You, if you move it, you will change the value. But the, all these changes are, are washed away from by the integral over h. But yeah, OK, it's interesting to think about whether you can cook up generalization, which hold even for, for um, homologically non-trivial cycle, but I really would not know how to define them because the, um, the definition of this operator, I mean, even if it actually do not depend on, on the, on which filling region do you choose in connected, in connected manifold, it really requires that you are performing this integral over, over this filling region. So if there is no filling region, I would not really know how to define the, the operator. Maybe there could be something, some generalization this is an interesting question, but I don't know. Well, in this case, it's sort of just like vortex operators. Um, there, you can also define them as endpoints of some strings, but it's like Dirac string, right? Like, yeah, yes. No yes. local operator can detect that string, so it's not there. So it's really yes, yes, yes. Indeed, we we actually we 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 called it quasi genuine operators because the the, the dependence on on the filling region is, is actually not there, but it turns out to be there when you go to more complicated manifold. If you go to disconnected space times. Then the situation changed. And this is very easy. Why? Because now let me consider the situation where you have two connected components. And, uh, and so your homologically uh, trivial co dimension one manifold lies all in one component. But now uh, you have four choices for what are the filling region. You can take D1, the inferior, D, D2, the exterior, but then you can take D1 uh, union X2 and D2 union X2. And in this case, the two operator QF associated to D1 and D2 are not equal even on average. So I really have an operator which is dependent on a, on a co-dimension one manifold, but on the additional choice of a filling region. And I, and I can have different operators. So this is now not a genuine co-dimension one operator. And if, even, even selection rules on these connected space times behave in a strange way. We are in a strange way because they are valid globally. If you if you take into account the operators uh, which are supported in all the connected components, but the selection rules can be violated in each in each connected component. So the, the um, I mean the, the correlation function can be non-zero, um, even uh, if all the even if the sum of the charges of all the operators in one connected component is. Um, is, is non-zero. But the only part I think is that the sum of the charge in all connected components is, is zero. This is kind of strange in, in usual quantum field theory. Usual quantum field theory, because the, the, mm, the correlation function in this connected space is factorized, uh, you, you, you might want to care only about one connected component of your space. Then. But here, here it is not. And if, 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 if you think about how, how this is possible, actually, this is why I, uh, I've been talking about the, the replica trick for a while is that secretly it's like as if your if your theory is not local. So the, the, there is non-trivial correlation even among different connected components of your space time because your theory is not local. Uh, and now uh, as, as far as it was just talking about a pure field theory analysis with random coupling, but let me now suppose that this ensemble average of quantum field theories is, is the dual description, is the boundary description of a certain quantum gravity theory in one dimension angle. And what this result is, is telling us is that you, you can really have the situation in which you have two disconnected boundaries connected by an Euclidean wormhole, and you can have charge violation in each connected component because the charge can flow through the wormhole. So this result that you get from field theory as a nice interpretation if you assume that, that your ensemble average of, of field theory as a quantum gravity dual description. So you, you, you can, I mean, you have global conservation of the charge if you take into account all the connected components, but the, the presence of these Euclidean wormholes, if they are there, 
uh, can tell you that the church is not is not locally concerned on the boundary. And, and another question that you can ask is what is the, the fate of the symmetry in the bulk? Because I mean, in standard tomography, you know that the usual correspondence is that global symmetries of the boundary quantum field theory are, are related with the presence of gauge fields in quantum gravity. And the correspondence is such that the boundary value of the gauge field of the quantum gravity theory is equal to the background gauge field for the for the global symmetry. But if we, if we accept this fact that the the operator cannot be put on 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 a trivial manifold, so you cannot turn on background non-trivial background gauge field for our symmetry. And even in the continuous case, you don't really have a, a, a conserved current. You can have a non-local conserved current in the, in the, the replica picture, or uh, the object which is conserved is really the, the sum of these two objects. I don't have really a, a vector J mu, which is conserved even on average. So I, I will say that the I, I cannot turn on background gauge field for the symmetry. So, and this is telling us that this piece of dictionary relating global symmetry of the boundary with gauge fields in the bulk cannot be true for the symmetry emerging only after average in the in this case of ensemble average with, with constant random coupling. So the I mean indeed the, the point is that if the if in the bulk we we could gauge the symmetry then the boundary value of the background gauge field of the bulk gauge field would be equal to the to a background for for the symmetry in the, in the boundary, but the, there cannot be no no non-trivial background for for the for for the boundary global symmetry. So I will conclude that this piece of dictionary can, cannot be true in this average symmetries. And so it's kind of not enough to ask what's the fate of the symmetry in the bulk if it remains a global symmetry, but it should be not because uh, I mean. At least in UVT, in UV complete theory of gravity, we believe that there are no global symmetries. Here, we are not dealing with UV complete theory of gravity, there are effective theory of gravity, so there might be that there are global symmetries, but it's really a question for the gravity theory to decide whether this, this symmetry is, is broken by some non-perturbative effect or, or remains a global symmetry. Here, we are we're just like drawing some conclusion from a pure field theory analysis. Actually, and, maybe, maybe I could, could comment on that. Yes. Um, I would actually say that I think this is exactly a global symmetry in the bulk. Um, I, we've talked about this some in, in, in my paper with Carmen on, on baby universes, um, but th this, this sort of, this is exactly what would be holographically dual to a global symmetry and it corresponds to the existence of an alpha parameter or the, the ensemble average. Um, and it's exactly for this reason that we wouldn't expect this in UV complete quantum. We wouldn't expect an ensemble average in UV complete mm -hmm. quantum gravity. Yes, I, 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 I agree. I agree. But there, there are certain papers uh, arguing that the symmetries, even if he appears to be global symmetry in, in, uh, in the quantum gravity, then the symmetry must be broken by either no perturbative effect or because of the presence of replica wormholes. So... To, 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 to explain what's happening there. So replica wormholes will, will break the symmetry exactly as in the way you described, right? They will, they will violate the local conservation of the charge. And what, if, if you, if you trust the replica trick, what it tells you is that the symmetry is broken in, the, in every member of the ensemble, in a member of the ensemble. But in the entire ensemble, the symmetry is preserved. Um, and in, in general, wormholes, you you need the, the the assumption you need to make is is that the replica trick is valid, which is secretly assuming some amount of UV completeness of your theory. Mm, I see Th that that including replica wormholes in the gravitational path integral is valid. That is a highly non-trivial assumption and amounts essentially to assume in some way amounts to assuming some amount of UV completeness of the theory. Um, Happy to talk about it more. I don't want to derail it. But I, I, I would say that this is this is a global symmetry in the bulk. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the comment. Yeah. So okay, let me let me conclude with some final comments. Uh, before I talked about disordered systems, and, and I think that this kind of, of disordered system of this disordered symmetries could have many applications. There are very complicated problems in this uh, in this complicated system, and you can hope to put some constraints on the IR on the long distance physics, excluding or proposing uh, several scenarios. 
So I think it's something which is worth to analyzing further. And what I haven't talked about, and we haven't discussed in great detail, spontaneous symmetry breaking of, of disordered systems. I always assumed the absence of spontaneous symmetry breaking, but you can think about a, a scenario in which you start from a, a theory of the pure system, which is which is realized a la Wigner, you, you break it explicitly by a disordered deformation, it reemerges after average, but it reemerges, but it's spontaneously broken. So I think that perturbatively you, you can kind of, of rule out this possibility, but per, non perturbatively it could be, and it would be interesting to analyze it. And something that I had no time to talk about is the, is the possibility of having emergent in the IR disordered symmetries uh, and, and the relation with. And, yeah, and there is some relation with logarithmic CFTs in the sense that what we uh, show is that if you take into account this possibility that a disordered system only emerges in the IR, you can analyze the, the prototypical example of an emergent symmetry, which is conformal invariance. Uh, and you can write down the worded entities, the, the disordered worded entities for conformal invariance. And by solving uh, this worded entities, you, you can actually see that generically, your uh, your critical point will will be a logarithm. It will be a, like a, a logarithmic CFTs. Uh, sometimes you you can rule out logarithm by assuming that there are symmetries which are preserved by the the, the disorder deformation, and you can rule out logarithm appearing in uh, in uh, correlation function of operators which are charged under the symmetry. But generically, uh, you would expect by I mean you, you can really show this by by solving the word entries. You can you can see. The generic there are logarithm appearing. And then, okay, an interesting question, of course, is to ask whether there are non invertible disordered symmetries. We, we, have, we have thought a bit about this, but I mean, we haven't found such interesting results. So, but I think it's, it could be there and it's worth exploring it. And also, about, about the ensemble average case, uh, I think it would be quite nice to wor work out what happens in concrete holographic model like XYK and understand, uh, and understand, I mean, what, what's really the fate of this, 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 um, this emergent symmetry in the, this um, average symmetry in the bulk, which yeah, I agree that you expect to be a global symmetry also in the bulk and we're working out in an explicit, an explicit model of holographic correspondence. And finally, let, let, let me mention that one can think about uh, the intermediate case in which H depends only on some of the coordinates. For instance, in condensed matter, it's, it's kind of natural to uh, take H to depend only, you have space and, and time, you have distinction between what is space and what is time. Uh, it, it is natural in that concept to, to take H to depend only on, on space coordinates and, and not on time. Uh, I think there should be some kind of mixed situation between the two cases. And I think it could be interesting to understand what is the, nature of the topological operator is there in that case, uh, because it could be like an intermediate situation, which is worth studying. So, okay, I think I will conclude here. Okay, well, thanks a lot for the talk. I There was questions in between, but does anybody have questions now at the end or? Yeah, uh, thanks for a very nice talk. Um, could you elaborate a bit on the spontaneous symmetry breaking? You said it can't happen perturbatively. Yeah, I, I think you, you can start from just writing Lagrangians. Uh, you will see what, I mean, for, for instance, you have the, a, a quadratic term and, and and you see what kind of interaction is, is turned on in the, in the, in the replica tree. Uh, you see that the sign of the of the term which arises is is never the one which allows you to to spontaneously break this imagery. If, if you do it explicitly with Lagrangians, so if you if you want to have a a, a spontaneous breaking in, in perturbation theory like with maximum like potential, uh, I, I I tried to to cook up Lagrangian doing this, but uh, I think it's not possible. But in, I see. In, so wait, can I try to reflect that back at you? So are you saying that, so the disorder field, let's call it like H, 
couples to phi, like h times phi, and the potential you get is coming from the two-point function of h, which has a definite sign. Yeah. So that's the idea, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. But e even if you just like perform the h part integral in the um, in, in in the replica trick, uh, if if you start from a a sensible probability like minus uh, h square, which is minus h square, right? So it is not plus h square because otherwise it's will it's ill defined. If you start from a sensible probability, then uh, you will see that the sign that you generate in the, in the replica theory is not the one compatible with spontaneous multiplicity. But yeah, in ge in general, in general, it, it could be if you if you take strong strong disorder, which we cannot treat it with simple with with Lagrangians, uh, that you can have a, a symmetry of the of the pure system which is not spontaneously broken, but it could emerge after the average and it is spontaneously broken. This is a kind of exotic, but it could be an interesting scenario. Thanks, that's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I also have a question. Very nice talk, thank you. Um, I think I understand a little bit better based on the discussion of the, the bulk interpretation, this idea that you can't put the symmetry operator on non-trivial cycles because that would correspond to turning on a background for a gauge field in the bulk or boundary value for a gauge field in the bulk. Um, is there a way to understand this, this constraint in terms of the non-locality of the theory? Um, I mean, it's obviously some sort of non-local constraint, but is there some more direct way to see why the, the fact that the theory is non-local means you can't put it on homologically non-trivial cycles? Right, right. Yeah, as, as, as I was mentioning, uh, these, uh, these operators have a counterpart in the replica theory. And, and mm -hmm. yeah, in, in, in the replica theory, you, you kind of find uh, the, the, the same constraint. Which which really comes hmm. from 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 non locality. You, you have to you have to do this double integration. So, I mean, I'm not I'm not very comfortable in, in doing this because I mean you have to deal with this non local currents. Uh, it is not completely clear to me because you have, you have a double integration. One only runs over the, the support, but you have another integration with which is over the, the full space time, which is the one which is defined for your current. Hmm. So it's a bit of a strange object, and. Uh, I'm not very happy and comfortable to deal with it, but actually, if you trust it, you, you can recover the same results. Awesome. Great, thanks. Yeah, very nice talk. Yeah. Okay, well, if there's no further questions, I guess let's thank Andre again, and next week we'll find another speaker. So, yes. Thanks oh, yeah. Do we have any volunteers from the audience? Yeah. Oh, no, they're leaving. The volunteers are leaving. <laughs> no, don't leave. No. <laughs> no. Wait, is Jake okay. still here? I'm, I'm happy to speak at some point soon, but I don't know. I don't think I can can have it together for next week. Um, no problem. Yeah. Um, but definitely happy to, to, to speak at some point. Um, cool. Yeah. Maybe in two weeks or so? Uh, let me get back to you. <laughs> okay, no problem. Sorry, we'll I know that's behind the annoying scenes. answer. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks for the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thanks again. It was great.